Hey everybody, Scout Crafter here again. It's Mishmash Wednesday, midweek Wednesday, and uh, we're going to do a little bit of a mosh today because we haven't done one in a couple days, or actually almost a week, and, and we've got a lot done. You know what? We've been very productive uh, this summer, more productive than I, I, I imagined to be because, you know, I, when it gets warm, I get kind of lazy. And I know some of you have been asking, what do I do with the projects that I finish? Um, the old time is the, the channel of the channel. No, what I usually do is when I get up a bunch of tools that are restored, I lay them out. I wrap them up in old towels and, you know, clean towels, old T-shirts, things like that. Wrap them up and then I put them in a bucket. Let me show you what I mean. OK, here are some of the tools we just recently did. And uh, some of these. What I will do is I will wrap these in old rags and t-shirts or whatever, and then put them in a bucket, okay, a clean bucket, nice clean bucket. I'll line the inside with paper to absorb any moisture and uh, wrap them in towels and, and whatnot, and then they go upstairs into storage. So that's what happens with uh, a lot of the tools that I do until I find a place where we could uh, move on to. But it does look so nice when they're all together. You know, all the different colors really start to pop. You know, as I'm wrapping this up, I'm noticing after this dries two or three days, you know, this really looks absolutely phenomenal, that that clear Tamaya paint. So if you're ever thinking of using it for something like that, it just looks so nice. It gets almost like an, um, like an enameled, like a Russian enameled, you know? Now, my dream is to one day when I get my new place to live in, wherever that might be, is to have a, a special room with all... The tools that I've restored just in there, just the restorations, things like that. And that would be nice. Like a tool wall like John Fix has, something like that, you know, around a whole room. I have enough videos and tools to do it. I'm sure I can fill up a room easily. Um, next up, what I want to talk about is uh, I was thinking about scouting. I was on my hike the other day at Poor Man's Flea Market. Again, walking around and I did this house that they've been throwing where i got the chest the cedar chest from they're throwing out a lot of stuff so i go there a couple times a week i don't even think they realize that garbage comes only once or twice a week they're throwing they're going to be careful they don't get a ticket but they're throwing stuff out every night so every night i take a walk by there and uh you know what i found i found this beautiful well let me show you the video here of what it looks like this is what it looks like you know what they're throwing out you could see there's stuff there air conditioners, all kinds of stuff that, you know, they must be cleaning out a garage or an attic or something. You could see the different array of things. And no, I didn't take the toolbox and or anything. But what I did take was I took this webbed chair. And when I saw it, I instantly loved it. First of all, it's not ripped up or anything or damaged. I sat in it. It could support 265 pounds, so I know it's strong. <laughs> This thing is absolutely gorgeous. You know, web chairs, as soon as I saw it, it was like a time machine. It took me right back. And do you remember growing up, these chairs were all over the place. And I know some of you still have them, but they were in the 70s and the 60s. These things were everywhere. Everybody had these type of lawn chairs. They were very uh, popular. They, every, you know, and they were just, they had their pros and cons. They weren't the most comfortable chair in the world, especially if you were wearing shorts you know, you remember when we were kids, if you were wearing those high shorts and those kind of webbing would little, give you a little pinch, but they were just terrific. And I and they, they bring back such nostalgia to me. You know, there were so many different type of chairs when we were younger. I remember our first chairs were these metal type chairs, you know, the ones that look like a big uh, shell, uh, you know, the metal ones, the stamp pressed ones, they were very popular years ago. And then they went with the folding and light chairs for travel and uh, and you know something, if you went to a barbecue or somebody's house or something and you, and you went in the yard, you know, obviously you would dig up chairs from wherever you could so people could sit down. The last thing you wanted to be sitting on is one of them dreaded folding metal chairs. I mean, all that was just, you know, that wasn't comfortable, no arms or anything. But if you were lucky enough and you got there early, you, mostly you'd let the older people sit in the nice chairs, but out of respect, but if you got there early and you got a nice chair, it made all the difference in the world, you know? Do you remember these chairs, these uh, tri-fold chairs? I can even still hear them. They used to make that kick, 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 kick when they opened and closed. Those things, you know what's funny? Everybody used to use them back in the day for sunbathing and stuff, and it seems like those things were always like oily. And because they were so low to the ground, they were kind of a pain to get in and out. And 
uncomfortable if you just wanted to have something to eat or something. That's like if you just wanted to chill out, rest, and lay down or something. They weren't so good for, for sitting, but there were so many different type of chairs. There were steel chairs, and they were wicker chairs. And, and you know, I think about that. And, but So when I got this web chair, I went online. You know, they still make, there's a um, Lawn Chair USA still makes these chairs today. Now, they're not inexpensive, but they are quality chair. And, and you know, uh, you know, they just bring back that, that feel. Remember that feel? And uh, nothing's worth it. You, you, these vinyl chairs, remember when these were popular like 10 years ago, These all these vinyl chairs came out. And uh, you'd leave them out in the sun for a while, and then it would start to get weak until one day you had one of your gravity-enhanced friends come over, and they sat in the chair, and the legs would just sprawl out. <laughs> or they would go back and fall off. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of vinyl. You know, that kind of stuff. There, there's use, good uses for vinyl, but for furniture and chairs, even the fences, you know. You put up them white vinyl fences, they look great for five, ten years, but then all of a sudden the sun makes them brittle, you know. You can almost kick right through them. So that's why I got the uh, chain link. I'm a big fan. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we got a couple things to talk about today. Okay, next up, while I was on my walk last night, I was looking at... Uh, uh, when I was a scout leader, I used to make all the scouts. We would go on these night hikes and we would... Uh, I would have a map of the town and they would have to map out all the fire hydrants and all the call boxes, a fire call box. And what that was, was a, a red box or um, they came in different configurations, but they had a red box with a handle. And if there was a fire, you could pull it down and it would bring the fire department to that particular call box. Uh, call boxes are going the way of the dodo bird. They'll be phased out soon. They're doing it little at a time. Um, because most people have cell phones and things like that. And remember, the call box would get you in the immediate vicinity and hopefully the firemen would see the smoke. So that's how that used to work. They had one in the city here every few blocks. And I don't know if you realize this, a lot of people don't, maybe if you're in a, a strange city, but call boxes always used to have lights attached to them to let you know there was a call box there. In the early days, they were like kerosene lights and then they went to electric, but they were usually a couple feet above the box to give you visibility to see them. However, they became, as cities got bigger, they moved the lights to the top of the pole. First, there was one halfway up the pole, they had a special light, and then they just started to tag on a small yellow or amber indicator light on top of a street light. To, sh to indicate that there was a fire alarm box or call box on that either pole or in the vicinity. So if ever you're in a strange area and you're looking around and, you and there's a fire and you don't have a cell phone, you would look for that orange light and then you would run over there and pull the alarm. So now you see with cell phones and everything, you know, this will be phased out. And I know my buddy Scott Durga, who's a collector of this kind of stuff, uh, you know, we like to kind of, you know, I'll, I'm going to wind up with a fire, a firebox. I know I am because now as they're starting to get taken down, they're showing up more at more reasonable prices. Um, do you have them still in your area? Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, uh, here in the city, they were all over. There were so many different, they used to be beautifully ornate ones, you know, they were cast iron and, and they were just lovely, but now they, they became, you know, shorter and smaller. I remember when I was a kid, there was a rash of people ringing the alarms. You know, that would happen a lot. You don't see too many false alarms anymore. But I mean, when I was a kid, there was, it was, you know, somebody would pull the alarm just to see what it was like. You know, it was kind of a dare or whatever. Kids in the 70s, right? So anyway, do you have those call boxes? Do you have those lights? Have you ever seen those lights on top of the building? And, you know, uh, another interesting thing, huh? Okay, it's 1.30 a.m. just coming in from my walk cut my walk a little bit short because when I was going by that house where I found the chest, look what they threw out. Yes, they threw this out in the garbage. It is a Wilton, more or less a Wilton homeowner's vice, but you could see the condition it's in here. So what we're going to do now, it works. The jaw's a little screwed up. You know, we've done, <laughs> we've done a lot worse, right? But what we're going to do now is we're going to take the whole vice and we're gonna drop it in my uh, bucket of vinegar and uh, and then we'll come back and look at it in 24 hours. So 
I'm going to do a, a vinegar because just the threads and everything are probably just as rusted. So let's do that. Okay, here we are. This was about 14 hours into the uh, into the vinegar. And uh, after you took it out of vinegar, it had to go in for an hour. And it don't need to be an hour, but you have to put it into some warm water with baking soda uh, just to make sure that you neutralize the acid okay so i put it in warm water with the baking soda let it neutralize i left it in for an hour took it out wire brushed it dried everything off uh so here we are this is where we're at now and you can see here we got rid of most of the you know all the rust and everything is gone there was rust in here and you know because they cast items and there were rust there was a ton of rust on the bottom here we got that cleaned up we got the top cleaned up. Everything is looking very nice now. Now, there's one thing here. This little captive drive nut here, uh, sometimes they're held in with a pin. You can knock it out. This one here, the way it is, see that little pin? Now, if you knock it in, I don't know how I would return it back. And this is supposed to float. I'm not messing with it. Believe me, do not, if you don't have to remove these kind of things, don't do it because they're set that way from, from the factory. And sometimes once, if I punch that out, how do I get it back in? Sometimes they have special tools to seat it. I'm not even, you know, if it was a screw or something, I'd take it out. But we got rid of all the rust around there, okay? And, uh, and then now with the jaws. Now, the top of the jaws were a little banged up. But what? sometimes you can reverse these jaws, but they go from one side to the other. And you turn them upside down so you have... Uh, that so if, we're going to see if we can do that reverse the jaws get a nice look on that and then we'll polish this up later this is just a wire brushing now what we're going to do is going to wipe everything down with alcohol denatured alcohol wipe everything down and shellac everything okay here we go it's been 24 hours everything's been shellacked you could see the finish the shellac leaves on here a nice sheen this is a great primer for any kind of paint that you want to use so everything's been shellacked, uh, the slide, and now it is going to be rust-free and rust-proof now because of, uh, of doing this. I also even did the hardware that you don't see that's underneath, uh, and uh, that's all been shellacked. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about jaws. For okay, me. next up, I want to show you why Wilton is a, uh, a better uh, manufacturer than many other vice manufacturers in the way the little details that you don't see on some inexpensive vices. Now I'm going to show you here. This here is the where the jaw attaches to to the vise. And um, if you look closely, of course, this ledge has to be uh, recessed so that it doesn't interfere with the jaws touching. Okay, that's number one. Number two, if you look over here, if you look closely at this little detail here, and this is important. Look at this little detail here. You see how this comes down? That little point there, that little corner, if you look here, here we have a drawing. If you look at the corner, it is, has a radius on it, okay, instead of a sharp angle. Now, they could have easily ran the mill across this. That's what they do when they, you know, they put it in a fixture. They run a mill through there. This, their mill is specially designed to leave a, a curved radius at the bottom instead of a perfect right angle like this and the reason is because that would be a stress point for fracture or cracking and very important to remember secondly because they added this little that they called it i think a fillet or fillet the reason they added this little curve is so that you take away that stress factor now if you have regular jaws you want to make uh, jaws for your vice a lot of times what you want to do is you want to avoid having a sharp 90 degree edge. And again, you can see here, this is the jaw for their vice. You can see how one edge here is chamfered because that fits in that part of the jaw that has that little curve. And again, that stops two things from happening. One, it stops any uh, pressure from if you're banging on top of the vice or the jaw from transferring down and creating a stress crack. And the second thing it does, it allows it to fit. It gives it a little bit of a gap there. So it rests on both the ledge and the back of the vise. Now, because the top of this jaw is a little mangled and beat up, I was hoping that I could reverse this like this, um, you know, switching the vise to the, uh, the jaws to the other side 
and uh, I would chamfer the back here, take off that sharp corner just like this one is, and put it in here. The problem is it sits a little bit high, and it leaves a couple thousands of an inch gap here. You can't have that. And the reason you can't have any gap between the, the jaws and the ledge is because now anytime somebody bangs on this, and you might have seen this before if you've done res uh, vice restorations, if anybody bangs this, it's going to put pressure on the screws of the that's holding the jaws onto the vise and what's going to happen is it's going to tear the screws out. and if you've ever seen one of these stripped out that could be the reason that the it's because of these were being banged on put the pressure there and remember this is only cast and it'll rip the screws right out of there so basically the screws you only want the screws to hold this secure but you want the ledge and the back to be holding the actual jaw, the replaceable jaws on here. You don't want the screws to be holding it on. They're just holding it so that it's in the position. You don't want it to take any brunt of any banging that happens. I hope that makes sense. Now, you know my favorite part. Remember what this vise looked like before we started? Okay, so now we've taken this vise and removed all the rust, uh, tuned it up a little bit, and you could see here now this is a, a vice that, you know, looks like it would be on anybody's workbench at home, but it is all protected from any additional rust. Uh, all the uh, uh, rust is gone. The somewhat original paint is here. It's ready for paint. So for our next episode, we will clean this up. We will uh, surface the, the jaws, the top, the back, and, uh, and make this look nice. And, you know, it's got this little, you know, this cast embellishment here and the Wilton. So... Maybe we can do this, you know, up pretty nice to make it look good. But now it's a good working vice, rust-free, and the price was right. Okay, so in closing, that was a terrific find, huh? And uh, there are so many ways that you can personalize uh, a vice and make it your own. But uh, we'll try and clean it up a little bit. I don't know what kind of paint we'll be able to do. It's supposed to rain all week. It's really not good to paint in high humidity, but... We'll see what we can do. We got to figure it out and uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Take care now. Bye-bye.